Hey everybody, it's Chris. Welcome back for part three of the over and under rebuild. Uh, I got things ready to go as you've seen in the previous two parts if you've watched them. And um, before we get going, there is something I'd like to point out here. Something I noticed on this case as I was cleaning it up, I wanted to point out, and that is the bottom. You'll see this divot here. That's not factory. What happens is a lot of the Olivers to adjust the alignment on the chain coupler have a screw in the frame that comes up and rests against here. Uh, 5 8 bolt, we'll go over and look. Here it is, right there. And it is used because the over and under, or even the two speed uh, hydropower, is not bolted directly to the motor, especially on your 310 size. There's a steel plate. There's this plate right here. You can see where the starter goes up here. This plate bolts to the block and then the bell housing bolts to this plate. So it should have been a little thicker because it can flex. And so the back end of that three speed will hang low and your chain coupler won't be lined up. And then the chain will wear prematurely and fail. And so they came up with a solution of putting an adjusting bolt in there and just run it up until everything's level. The lock the jam nut. Well, I, I do. I've actually heard of ones wearing through like uh, this one was trying to do to the point where the fluid comes out. And then next thing you know, uh, she's dry and ruined. So I make a steel plate. Boy, I don't know, at least quarter inch thick drill a little divot in it. I'll have to do it for this one so that it stays on the bolt here and then put that in. And then, uh, then I can run my bolt up against that. It spreads the load out against the bottom of the case and doesn't grind a hole through the case. So something to think about. Hate to see someone have a over and under fail because of that bolt grinding its way through after all these years. This one was well on its way. First thing to go in, I put the thrust washers in and to help hold them in place, I put some clean, sticky grease on the back side of them. And that helps hold them in the case where they need to be pretty close anyways. There's a tab on them. You'll see the tab, little slot in the case that lets that tab sit in. So you don't want those thrust washers spinning. And there to keep the case from wearing, to take the wear or the brunt from the uh, counter shaft. From there, put the bearings in the bottom shaft, they just slide in there. A needle type roller bearing. Shaft goes in the front with the pump drive gear towards the back. And then just carefully set her down in there. And of course the washer fell off. There it fell off. We can put it back in. Then you want this counter shaft pulled out towards the outside. Next thing we need to get in is the support in the back here and to help keep that all lined up and everything. Take a couple of 3 8 bolts, about yay long. I don't know, five inches, something like that. They can be longer because you'll be taking them out one before it's all said and done. Next up is this piece, and if you look on the inside, you should remember taking an O-ring out of that little hole there. Take the grease gun, put a little grease on that. It'll all blend in. There's only one size of these smaller O-rings. They're all the same in the package anyways. Put that in there, and the grease helps hold that in place. 
and then this o-ring has to line up with this hole down there <laughs> It's, it's lining up. Helps if I get it in square. Is it something the rubber mallet can fix? Yes. So that's in. And we start putting the guts back on this side. Next up is the thrust washer. This thrust washer. And it goes, so this is facing the front. This cut edge faces the back. And once it fits in there, you can feel how it's supposed to fit. Then the expensive bearing. I looked this one up online, Agco's price book now you can pick a dealer and see what they charge for it and this one's like just over 400 bucks for this bearing through agco so that slides on there and then the planetary gear set goes in if you did everything right you got the ceiling ring right there Kind of have to wiggle a little bit just to get into that ceiling ring and then it's on there when you get the sub assemblies done ahead of time it all goes together pretty quick because now we've got the direct drive shaft to go in which is this baby i'll make sure the brass washer let's set that right there that brass washer is still in there and this other thrust washer is still in there. Got both of your ceiling rings in place. That's a matter of just feeding it on through and then getting the planet gears to engage. There we go. That's not too bad, is it? Well, I see no reason we can't get that bottom shaft up into place. Counter shaft support, we need to put a new O-ring on this end, work it in from the front. A little grease on the o-ring helps make sure everything slides in good this slotted part is going to be on the front when you're done so you want this end to go in first so we get that front thrust washer to line up Careful of your fingers. There's the front. Make sure that back's lined up. I think I'm up to the thrust washer. Yep, that's out of place. Take a screwdriver and roll that back to where it needs to be. I think I got it. Or something close. Yep, I'm up to the O-ring on the front. And it's in. I used to have a strap I would bolt, a, bolt across the front of here to keep this shaft from moving. 
But generally I just uh, carefully set it down, set something under there to keep it from coming back a little bit. You'll see in a moment. I have one more bolt with the head chopped off that I hid from myself. There it is. This is a quarter inch bolt. And of course I got the bottom shaft 180 degrees off, but it turns easy enough to do that. Next up, sun gear shaft. Already got the ceiling rings in it. That's all it needs. My output shaft might be wiggled just a little bit to get everything lined up. She goes. Got this thin needle bearing that just fits in there. There's that screwdriver. able to get a new thrust washer for here as you can see they made the holes just a little bit smaller on the new one a little less likely to break the groove sides go towards that needle bearing i just put in now it's time for the sprag clutch a couple notes about the sprag clutch that i should have mentioned while i was putting it together this is the old one it wasn't in bad shape and at 400 and some bucks, you might think, well, maybe reuse it. I suppose you could. First of all, it goes in like this. So your drag strips are facing that way. Or the inner drag strips, which are the important ones, are towards the front. See them in there? And they are important because they give enough drag so that the inner part wants to turn a little bit and move those wedges when it needs to. So if for some reason underdrive doesn't work in your three speed, this is definitely the culprit. If these little tabs in here, those internal drag strips are bad, um, it can't really get the motion that it needs between the two halves to uh, activate. And hopefully that's your problem. The other problem would be uh, these have chewed into the shaft and worn it away and the tolerance on that is a half of a thousandth. So it doesn't take much wear to, for them to start slipping. slipping. Just some uh, insights into the sprag and how it works and what to look for. Okay, sprag clutch is in. Quick little test, make sure I did it right. I should be able to turn the output shaft this direction, because that's the engine, the direction the engine turns without moving this shaft, because that's when it freewheels, and it does. And if I turn this shaft, this outer sun gear shaft, it should turn the inner shaft. So I've got her in the right direction. Now normally I would start putting more of this on, but I want to tip it back up so we can kind of go over how this thing even works.
Let's go over that. The splines here engage the clutch discs in the drum, and these teeth engage the gear on the counter shaft. So when you're looking at it from the back side, the engine turns this way, counterclockwise from the rear. So let's start an underdrive. Power goes from these teeth to these teeth to these, which are also driving the pump, to this gear here, which we remember is uh, got that planetary gear set bolted onto it. Can almost see a gear in there. I can't push it ahead far enough to say so. So power is going through there, transmits to this, that turns this slower because of the tooth count, smaller gear, larger gear. And those two are, I think that's a little bit bigger up there than this one, but overall you get your reduction back here. That turns because it's, it's trying to turn those sun gears inside the drum here. If they roll, they're gonna wanna push this sun gear shaft this way, which engages that sprag clutch and forces the output shaft to turn. So everything, oops, I'm going backwards, but everything turns like that as a single unit. This and this, get your gear reduction here. If you can just make them out with those planet, yep, there's one. The planet gears do not turn in underdrive because in order to do that, they'd have to turn this unless you get in a situation where you're coasting downhill, which does happen and it starts freewheeling this here and I will hold the outer shaft and uh, turn and you can see it free wheels that's essentially what's happening is the engine is kind of holding this shaft back it can only go as can't go any it's going to go the same speed as the engine and so when you're going downhill, this shaft can speed up. Once you catch up and this outer shaft is going the same speed, then those little wedges do their little thing, twist just ever so slightly, lock in. Well, you've got power again in underdrive. I just don't have enough hands. Here it is freewheeling. So hopefully we can see the planet gears turning in there. I can. As they revolve around the sun gear shaft. That's why it's called a planetary set. So that's uh, underdrive. Now you shift into direct. Oil goes into here through the housing up in there and through those ceiling rings, like I was telling you, all the way in to the clutch pack there. The piston squeezes that all together as one until the friction so much that they got to turn together. So drum is turning engine speed, which means output shaft is turning engine speed. So you got direct drive. And uh, this sun gear shaft outside here is still turning the same direction, but slower. So the sprag clutch free wheels, there's no, uh, only oil needed for the sprag clutch, clutch is purely lubrication. It's a mechanical engagement. So if for some reason underdrive doesn't work in your three speed, you've got, it's not anything that's hydraulic. It's not, something's probably torn up somewhere. All right, so now, you know, direct drive, output shafts turning faster into the sun gear shaft because that sun gear shaft is still running through the gears on the bottom. So now we put it in direct or in overdrive. Of course the oil releases from the clutch pack there, exhaust back through. And that lets that stuff release and not provide a drive anymore. And oil now goes through this hole into the back cover, 
squeezes that piston down, pushes against this, and actually stops this shaft from turning. Let's see if I can set this up. So I will turn the bottom shaft. Right now it's an underdrive, and I'm going backwards. Okay, so I'm turning the bottom shaft. It's in underdrive. I hit overdrive. This stops turning, this sun gear shaft. And as you can see, it just sped up. Now all those little planet gears have to turn as they go around the sun gear. Well, as they turn, they're also engaged in this drum. So that speeds up the drum. So let's just put a dab of grease. Like right there and right there. So you can see where they start out. And then let's see. Yeah, I'm going the right way, so let's see if they make it around the same. Pretty much. Could be some free freewheel in there since everything ain't all together. But so now let's back that up just a little. I put it in overdrive. Piston squeezes these clutch packs down. They're pushed against this plate that does not turn, so they can't turn, so this shaft can't turn the sun gear. So, see, there goes the grease on the drum. And there's the grease on the planet carrier. And in about, looks like just over two turns. For every two turns this one makes, this one makes three. Which is about right it's somewhere around a 20 percent speed increase from direct to overdrive but that is what's going on just a matter of, I, when i first learned that i thought it was neat that actually stopping a gear makes it go faster that's how the magic happens got the unit tipped back down again i put a socket under the input sh or the uh, the output shaft there i mean front end of it just to hold pressure up against it so it doesn't settle down because it sits back just a little bit from the opening so next thing i'll do is find my o-rings and put the one on for this housing here is that it that seems to be it It could go on later, but it, uh, less stuff to slide over. So next up is this. There is a step to it. The other side's flat. Flat side goes towards the housing. Step side goes back. Doesn't matter which set of holes, they're all evenly spaced. Slide that down there. Time for some clutch discs. So we start with a steel and then alternate with fiber. Once again, just like with the uh, direct drive clutch pack, if these are brand new, soak them down with a little bit of oil first. Um, what I'll do is just uh, have a little oil can or something and put a little on each layer as I put it in. They'll soak it up while they're sitting waiting before I actually bench test it and then it'll get lubricated then. But Then there's this thrust washer. The groove side goes towards the back. The non-groove side goes towards the sprag clutch. Sits right there. Probably ought to get around and put that plug in. Uh, it's got this small O-ring, then a larger one on the outside. 
same size o-ring that went on the front of the shaft there for the larger one a little bit of grease in that hole helps keep the o-ring from wandering o-ring faces down There will be an o-ring on the back cover that seals against this so that the oil can go, uh, lube oil can go into the bottom shaft there. And this has got to line up, but as we saw before, we can twist it a little bit if we need to. And then the outer o-ring keeps that oil, lube oil from coming back out. And the little o-ring just seals uh, the bolt that goes through here so you don't end up with oil everywhere. Next up, we'll put some springs in. Okay, springs go in the holes that the bolts don't. Since we got one here and here, it's every other hole. So one there, one there, one there, one there, and one there. These are the springs. They push against this plate, which in turn sits against the piston, the outer edge of that piston there. So that when you disengage overdrive, that piston returns back quickly so that the clutches ain't dragging and causing wear and horsepower loss and heat and all that stuff. So it just rests like that. Then we need a dab of grease again for the holes on this cover. Two more of those little O-rings. One down here for the lube circuit. Another one over here for the overdrive clutch pack. The O-rings on here. I might put a film of grease on that just to make everything slide together nice. We can now take the cover and set it on there. And line up those guide bolts. And then this guide bolt. There. Then it comes to the shaft. The bearing gets to where it's land on the shaft. Rubber hammer. There she goes. Got our bolts. New copper washers. This bolt also keeps that bottom shaft from turning, support shaft, and it keeps it tight against the O-ring, so it has a couple of duties. We can take these out and put the bolts in there. Sure hope I didn't forget anything. And one more, a 3 8 bolt right there. That one does not need a copper washer because it's a blind hole. It does not go all the way through the housing, so oil can't get through. Now we need the O-ring that goes down in there to seal the... That might be a little bit small. 
or it might be it. That looks to be about the same size. That's smaller yet. I guess that must be it. That's all that's in the kit. Make sure that O-ring seated in the groove. That looks good. Next part, the 3314 something, something, something. Output sprocket. And I was able to procure a new nut. Because as you can see, the old one had been abused. Kit comes in with a new one of these. Locking tab doohickey. Rounded edge goes down in the face of the locking tabs. Get on there. There she is. That's tight enough for the moment. I can now tip the unit back up. You definitely want it tighter than that, but it'll be easier with the unit tipped up. Get that out of the way. I like to put these guide bolts that I use in the back and the front here to get the front cover on. Well, the biggest thing to watch out for, there's a slight notch in the side of the housing that lines up with that notch for the shift spool. So you just wanna make sure you get the right set of holes. So that notch, notch. And then it's just a matter of the wiggling game. kind of shake and jiggle. Eventually each clutch disc will fall into place on the drum. It'll get a little farther. Just don't force it. There. Cover comes right up. Nice and tight. Got my new O-ring in there. So now other than the side cover, I've got a over under unit. This is another good point to test your handiwork. I haven't tightened down this nut all the way yet. I usually stick like a screwdriver or something in here, keep the gears from turning. But if you hold the input shaft still and you've got your sprag clutch in right, you'll be able to turn this direction, but you won't be able to turn this direction without the input shaft turning. Because this is freewheeling the transmission turning faster than the engine. So if you can't look at the back here, hold the front shaft still and turn it counterclockwise, you've got something together wrong. Most likely your sprag clutch is in backwards, which just involves taking this part off, pulling it out, turning it around. So let's do a little air testing. We'll start with direct. We'll hear some hissing because those ceiling rings, they haven't seated and there's little gaps in them. But when I give it air, should hear it engage. Well, let's put the grease on. Yeah. There's a grease spot there and there. Okay, direct drive. You can see the drums turning faster than the planet set. Small amount of air leakage, but that was to be expected. You can also definitely feel 
that direct takes more oomph to turn than underdrive. You're turning those planet gears. So there's just more action there. So we're back in underdrive because there's no air pressure, oil pressure. We'll do overdrive now. That doesn't leak so much because there's no one of those ceiling rings. And we can see that the drum is turning much faster than the planetary set. So, there. Sounds like everything's in good shape. So we are now to the point of putting the side cover on and putting the bell housing on and putting some oil in it and testing it. I hit it some of the impact. Well, you can see we're at doing that. It's kind of rounding on my nubs there. Mm, that got her tight. Then you just want to find a tab that lines up with one of the notches. Some of the later whites actually used a hex nut. I don't know why they didn't just do that all along. They probably had their reasons that I don't understand. So bend this tab down. There we go. Keep that nut from coming loose. So if it does, about the biggest thing is this sprocket will start wearing on those shaft, splines on the shaft back here. Other things can wobble around too. That's tight. Wanted to get that done before I closed up the side cover. And one more time of putting in these tiny O-rings. A little dab of grease to help hold them in their holes. I've got the gasket all doped up and in place. Just a matter of setting her on there. and bolts and nuts. I'll be short one bolt because this hole was empty. I'm gonna get the bell housing on next so I can get everything tied up here so it seals. I missed. Swing and a miss, there we go. Get this uh, blue blind in. Uh, must go the other way. Yes, it does. Be that way. We'll run you in with an end wrench and then snug you up with a line wrench. Press the new throwout bearing onto the carrier. It says non-greasable type on it, but I like there's this groove in there where it slides on that tube. And I've seen more than one tube get pulled out. So I am putting, this is not just regular grease. This is high temperature clutch grease. And I think they say a minimum of a 450 degree dropping point, which they race, rate grease by basically just put a dab of grease on something and uh, heat it up. 
and the point where it starts dripping or dropping is its drop point and it gets pretty warm in there in that bell housing and so clutch grease is designed to uh it's usually pretty thick it's designed to melt at a much higher temperature that's probably also a reason some throw out bearings fail these guys have a greasable clutch bearing throw out bearing here and they don't think about what grease goes in it and not all greases are compatible especially some of this high temperature clutch grease it uh you pump in just regular old molly grease into an incompatible one and the, the two react and become just almost like little rocks and then you pump that into your bearing and it goes out in no time and you wonder what the heck happened well it was you mixing greases that's part of the trouble of buying a used tractor is uh, who knows if uh, the previous owner used the right grease in the right place but i guess he ain't got much choice but to roll with it don't forget what i said in episode one about that bolt that holds the uh, throw out fork that when it's all assembled the head faces back towards the over and under unit or hydropower or whatever you got it'll go on either way but it, you won't be happy with it when you put it on backwards not sure what to assign for a value for the throw out bearing something i had on the shelf one of the engineers from oliver told me he would always put a little molly grease on these splines because if they get dry and rusty the clutch disc can hang on them and then it'll drag against the flywheel and cause your transmission to keep spinning and make shifting hard i don't do it i get to get too much grease in here and have it fling around and especially if it's on the splines it's going to fling right out to where the surfaces are and get grease on that and that's not good before i put this lever back on it's just a roll pin in the bottom here that engages this gauges the spool and as you can see it's got a considerable amount of wear on it so i'm going to drive that roll pin out and put a fresh one in i've seen them get loose in here some guys braze them up or whatever or that pin will slide right out and uh actually i think it was a solid pin originally so this one might have already been replaced but the pin slides out of the hole and all of a sudden you can't shift lever moves easy it's a good place to look well what well, you know it i don't have that particular size of roll pin on hand fortunately this is not hard to get to you can do it in the tractor if you need to so i'm just going to put it back in with the old roll pin for now so i can test it and you can see a fair amount of slop there put it back in for now and i'll get a new roll pin so hooking in my pressure gauge to test the unit out and then i need to get my loop line in here and fill her up with oil drain plug is in this is my loop line I use. We used it at the dealership. It just consists of a couple of cooler lines from a junked out, parted out tractor. And then what's in between is just actually an anhydrous ammonia hose. But that's nice because it's clear. It kinks. That's the bad part. Getting this just right to where the line doesn't kink. But I can see when the oil is flowing through and verify that getting good flow through the cooler circuit. It's not a high pressure circuit. So a couple of hose clamps and some, uh, this one's gotten stained red from the years of ATF going through it. Right about there, it shouldn't do too bad. It might just be time to replace this hose. I can barely see through it anymore. Maybe I'll do that. Green over and under units um, came with automatic transmission fluid. So chances are you're gonna find red in them. I stated in the earlier editions of this item is gonna switch over to universal. I've got a service bolt that White sent out that they were gonna start putting universal hydraulic transmission fluid um, the AGCO equivalent, equivalent today is 821XL. I believe John Deere's High Guard is an equivalent. 
But that's what I'm gonna, since I got the whole thing drained and cleaned out, I am gonna switch to universal. I wouldn't mix the two. I think contamination between different types of oil can be bad. But if you're looking for automatic transmission fluid to put top off yours, if you're looking for a Dextron, Dexron 3 equivalent, and it should say somewhere on the label. Uh, there are some later Dexrons that are not the same, even though they have the same name. I think like the fives or sixes are pretty different. Some of them have friction additives and stuff. So it's, it's important to get the right transmission fluid in there if you're sticking with the automatic. Uh, the universal, readily available. My newer tractors use it. So pretty easy to top it off. That's what I use in all my hydraulic systems now. And then I don't have to worry about contamination on that end. These hydro or three speeds were about a five quart reservoir. There's a gallon. Let's see what the old dipstick says. Of course, you got cooler and ho lines going to the cooler. Yeah, see, I'm showing over full. That was just one gallon. So I'm sure it'll go down by the time oil gets into all the pistons are empty right now. Of course, the cooler ain't hooked up to it, and that will be later. So I'll run this. It'll probably go down some, get it in the tractor. And then once it runs, I'm sure I'll have to top it off again because then the cooler and all the lines will be full. But if you're just draining the unit just to change the oil, uh, about four or five quarts will get you do going. There seems to be a little. The later uh, super units, I think, were six quarts. They had a deeper case bigger counter shaft but they held a little more oil because of that so we'll start with that much i didn't end up going to town but i did end up uh looking in my parts and some of you might recognize this it's a tube new old stock for uh the uh, insecticide box on a white 6000 series planner probably well a 246 it would work on a 5100 as well and it works on this I just got to slice off this uh, expansion part here and then I'll have a nice clear tube to watch the flow in. Might have to put a smaller gauge on to read the lube pressure. Seems like it ought to come up a little more than that. Okay, put a lower pressure gauge on. This is actually an engine oil gauge, but. Looks like I'm getting just under 25 PSI for lube circuit pressure. I do believe that's within spec. I might go check the book. Now the book shows uh, 27 to 33 PSI for, for a uh, circuit pressure. So I would say we're not too far off the mark for turning less than probably idle speed or somewhere right around idle speed. So I will switch back to the other gauge. So we can check the uh, clutch pressures. It's supposed to be 140 to 160 PSI for, uh, ooh, my hose ain't get much longer for this world. And there it goes. Well, that's a bummer. It's turned a lot of over and unders in its time. I'm sure I can just uh, shorten it up some. Earlier ones were 160 and 140. When they came out with the Super Duty, over and under they bump clutch pressures up so i am going to uh air more on the high side obviously uh there wasn't a whole lot of in the as far as the pressure components not a lot changed in there so i'm going to try to get at least 160 out of it get a good uh solid grip on things shim that was in there 5 10 15 20 
No, let's try. 25 PSI, hopefully, with this stack. It's quite the stack. And there they go. And a drop another one. Oh, got it. That takes some strength, especially on a table with wheels. Let's see what she is now. Doing just a little, oh, starting to smell the magic smoke in the drill. Start doing a little over uh, 160, maybe 165. I like that. You'll probably do a little bit more, you know, up to full RPM. Later units, they did bump the pressure up on, and those circuits should be, I mean, they take the same O-rings, they take the same piston seals. So I see no and clutch discs. Actually, the later uh, Super Duty ones actually had slightly thinner clutch discs, and then they could get one more in the stack. So I think that's going to work. There we have it. I do believe it's done. No uh, oil running out up here, and it's dry inside the shaft there. Nothing coming out the back. Lube circuit looks good and dry. Well, first part of the 1855 is done. Other things I had to spend money on, this output shaft nut, that only cost me $5.06. Not bad at all. And the This thrust washer that goes between the sprag clutch and that bearing on the sun gear shaft that only run me nine dollars and 57 cents that is a 721 60305 and then the cost of a filter i used a wix 51 307 There we have it. I do believe it's done. No uh, oil running out up here. And it's dry inside the shaft there. Nothing coming out the back. Lube circuit looks good and dry. Well, first part of the 1855 is done. So I hope everybody uh, found this useful or at least uh, entertaining. If you have any questions that uh, maybe something I missed, didn't cover, or just uh, got a question, go ahead and put her down in the comments. I read them all. Uh, so try to help out the best I can. And I appreciate everybody watching. Thanks again.